Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Evan A. Williams. I'm currently serving as the Director of Virtual Experience and Peer Engagement Initiatives here at UC San Diego in Student Affairs. I will be your moderator today. So glad you joined us. So excited to have you as a Triton. For today's panel, we have a group of panelists who are here to answer your questions. A lot of you have concerns about returning to learn, what's going on in the world, what will it look like, how will we engage? Well, we're here to give you some answers and perspectives and let you know what we know and what we may not know currently given the situation of our world. Um, we will attempt to answer all of your questions that you submitted beforehand, so please feel free to enter other questions using the Q&A but as you know, we may not be able to answer all the questions as we're on a limited time and we have a lot of information we wanna share with you. And there's more of you than there are of us. Please feel free to look up additional information after this by going to Return to Learn website. That would be return to learn with no spaces.ucsd.edu to get more information. We're keeping tabs on all the questions you ask. So we're committed to answering and providing as many answers as we can. But first, I'd like to welcome Chancellor Pradeep Kosla for opening remarks. Thank you, Ebene. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, everybody. And I'm so glad that you're joining us uh, for the student town hall. Over the last couple of months, you've been hearing from me uh, primarily through the mode of announcements I'm making to, camp uh, to the whole campus. But we thought it'd be a good idea to have a town hall where we could have our senior leadership, our faculty, our staff talk to you directly. These are also the people who have participated in multiple gr groups and task force uh, meetings to define how we're gonna repopulate, incrementally repopulate this campus. And these are the people you're gonna hear from. So let me first start by saying a big thank you to all of our panelists today, because these are the people whose hard work uh, you're gonna be able to see uh, and, and the outcomes of that hard work. Uh, I also wanna assure you that there were many, many decisions that were made during the course of these uh, conversations over the last couple of months. These were not always easy decisions, but they were always guided by evidence, they were guided by science, and they were guided by the expertise of our faculty and our staff. And the task groups had faculty, staff, and students involvement throughout. And most of the answers we had to come up with, uh, some were simple, but many were very tough. And they were tough primarily because we know very little about this pandemic. We know very little about the disease. And every day we're learning more and more and more. And as we learn more, it informs our decision making. We also have to follow our county and state guidelines, uh, county and state public health guidelines. And all of these decisions uh, that we have made are basically in accordance with all those, all those guidelines and in accordance with uh, our understanding of the pandemic and how we want to start opening our campus. So uh, let me also say a big thank you to our students. Uh, during the course of these last uh, three or four months, what I've realized is our students have amazing grit and amazing resilience. So let me say thank you very much. Uh, thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for being part of this great campus, this great university. Uh, and let me just hand this over to Ebene now because what you really wanna hear from are the panelists and not me. Thank you very much, Ebene. Thank you, Chancellor Kosla, and um, I appreciate you sharing all the work that we've been doing and the community that we have. I'd like to welcome the host of this town hall, Vice Chancellor um, Allison Satterwin. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, first, like the Chancellor, I want to thank everybody for putting this town hall together. And to those of you who've joined us this evening, thank you for your time. We all know that you have been impacted in some way by the pandemic and that this is an extremely difficult situation that continues to require our practice of patience, of flexibility, and resilience, and that we strive to put our community's health above all else. In addition, we know how challenging it is to make decisions about what is best for your particular circumstances this coming quarter. And tonight's town hall is the first of many efforts on our behalf to improve communication with students, to answer questions, and provide you with the most up-to-date information that we have so you can make informed decisions. We will be hosting a monthly town hall for students, as well as hosting an in-depth focus group series with students. And before we move into the first part of the town hall, I just wanted to reiterate to all of you and, and your loved ones that we are guided by our goal to keep students at the center of our work. 
to keep our students engaged, supported, and above all else, healthy. And we will get through this very difficult time together. So thank you again for being here with us tonight. And we look forward to answering your questions and uh, being of service. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor Satterlin, for those warm remarks. With that, I'd like to introduce our next, pan next panelist. We're here to talk about Return to Learn, and this person will bring us up to date on Return to Learn, the pandemic. I'd like to welcome Dr. Angela Sosha. She's our Interim Director of Student Health Services and a leader on the Return to Learn project. Angela? Um, as you know, we are seeing a significant increase in viral activity in the United States. Uh, some of this is a reflection of testing, but in uh, addition to that, I think we know that we are also seeing more viral activity as we see um, our hospitals um, increase in census, particularly in our community here in San Diego. Um, I'll show you the next slide. You'll see, though, on this first slide that we never really got into a very stable and prolonged plateau. And that's where you're hearing folks say that, did we come back a little bit soon? and why we're seeing this dramatic rise. Now the rise is not consistent throughout the country as you'll see on the next slide, but we're seeing a significantly more increase in the southern part of the country and in the western part. And of course, that has a direct impact on us in Southern California. We have some seen some increase in our community. It is not overwhelmed our health system though, and I wanna reassure everybody that we are doing quite well. Our hospitals are open. We're continuing with regular care, or elective surgery, et cetera. So the teams are keeping up. We have plenty of PPE and we are able to care for our community. On the next slide, you'll notice that the rise in cases also is going up, not across the board, but we're seeing a significant increase in young folks. And uh, the young adult population um, seems to be um, uh, potentially through behaviors as well as testing access, we are seeing more activity um, in our younger community. And we're taking this into account as we plan for the fall. On the next slide, you will see that we see that there is hope though, that with mitigation strategies, some of the recent rise that we have will be able to control what's going on, bring it down into a much more manageable situation. And San Diego has in fact increased and pulled back a little bit. We no longer have dining in our restaurants. We had that for a short period of time. All the bars are closed and our San Diego County Public Health is actively monitoring the situation and they will um, provide further guidance, potentially more restrictions or slowly allow more activity um, abnormal activity as the viral activity in the community changes over time. And we're all watching this quite carefully and taking into account as we plan and go forward. On the next slide, you will see that we've developed a number of tools for assessing how we're going to um, approach this. It's basically three platforms. It's risk mitigation, viral detection intervention. So how do we mitigate things? We do this for our personal behaviors particularly insisting on masking when we are out and we are near others. Um, sanitation, a lot of hand sanitizers all over, increasing the common areas, the cleaning and the cleansing. Also how we set up our configurations of our classrooms, as you noticed on one of the pre-slides, that we're not gonna have the auditoriums filled with students sitting right next to each other. Students will be spaced out. So by using space as well as cleanliness, and um, masking protections and distancing, we think you can reduce the risk of spread. The next phase is by looking at viral detection. And there are a number of elements to this, which includes very easy access to symptomatic testing for anybody who develops symptoms. And we're very lucky that we have a very strong health system that we're partnered with. The laboratory there has um, increased its capacity and continues to do so. So we're actually able to get test results back for our students and our campus community within a day or two days at the longest, which is much better than many other parts of the country are experiencing. So we have strong support in the ability to test for evidence of the virus. We're also going to be doing some periodic asymptomatic testing and screening by doing these surveillance approaches. We believe we will be very quickly able to identify viral activity and tamp down spread. 
And then another, another novel approach we'll have is we're going to look at the waste streams coming out of our various buildings. Using um, sophisticated uh, DNA technology, we're able actually to detect low levels of virus in the waste streams of our various buildings. So we'll be monitoring those building on, buildings on campus. And this will give us a signal if we have an individual um, who's starting to shed virus, we can swoop down and begin some testing and identify that individual and support them. So how do we support individuals? We're gonna identify individuals with the virus, provide them support on campus, and I'll speak to that a little bit for how we do that for our students. We'll be doing our own case um, investigation and contacting others who might be exposed and then giving them guidance. So the individuals that are exposed potentially are supported until we find out whether or not they actually were to develop COVID-19. Underneath this is a platform of adaptability. And this is really something we have to keep in mind. As Dr. Uh, uh, Chancellor Kosa mentioned, this, we've not had much time with this virus. If you think how many months, it's only a few months the scientists have really been able to explore and understand this virus. And we continue to learn constantly about the virus's biology and we also have to keep in mind what is happening in our local community. So we will adjust our plan um, to keep up with the science and to keep up with what's happening at the time. So on the next slide. So we're going to be very much working on reducing the spread by de-densifying the campus, having fewer individuals on campus. Um, individuals can work remotely, will work remotely. Students whose classes can be effectively taught remotely and they can learn remotely. Some of the classes you saw, 70% will be remote. So that will help us de-densify the campus. We'll work at the configurations of the classroom sizes. We'll only have two students to a bedroom. This will work very well. And then we're also, as I mentioned, we'll use social distancing in our approach to the way the dorms are assigned, the classrooms are assigned. So we will be able to identify individuals who are ill through all the steps that I mentioned. We will also isolate our student residents who develop the um, infection and need to be um, brought into an isolation housing. We've set aside separate units on the campus. These units have individual bedrooms, bathrooms. They'll be the only student living in the area and they will receive full support with food at every day, food deliveries. They will also have a medical check-in every day and they'll have the mental health providers who are counseling and have um, psychological services team checking on them as well. Through our case investigation and contact notification, we'll also expose other members of the campus community, students, including students, if they need, need any other support and guidance and if they need to be quarantined as well. So with these things, we hope to really, if there is some viral activity on campus, keep it to a minimum, support the individuals who develop the COVID-19 um, infections and to get them through those quite uh, safely. Student health remains fully open, providing care for the students on campus. We um, are, will be there. We will expand to a seven day a week operation so that our students will get all the support that they need um, during this period. And the academic advisors and the instructors have been very responsive to any students who needed any support during any illness. Luckily our students have done very well. We've not had a seriously ill student on campus. We hope that continues to be the case. Thank you, Dr. Sosha, for getting us up to speed on return to lane, our safety protocols, and what has happened on campus since this pandemic has started. I'd like to welcome back to the platform Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Dr. Jer Satterland. Thanks again, Dr. Williams. I appreciate it. So, as you all can imagine, we have had to move our operations uh, in very dramatic fashion to a virtual and remote student experience keeping in mind that we are working from a place of student-centeredness in the work that we do together in service of our students' uh, dreams and success. We have put together a number of resources to ensure students remain engaged, have the opportunity to build community, participate in leadership development, get to know their college community, um, understand the resources that are available to them virtually as it relates to identity-based experiences, um, certainly the importance of, of art and culture uh, for our students and their development and their desired experiences at UC San Diego, 
as well as making sure that our transfer students and our international students, our veteran students, and our identity-based communities have the opportunity uh, to be a part of meaningful out-of-classroom learning, social, and development opportunities. So this slide reflects the resources that we wanted to highlight this evening that will be made available in the recording for students. And you'll see links to our virtual student union, which is a hub for all of the remote and virtual activities available on our campus for students, regardless of whether they're living with us on campus or whether they'll be studying remotely away from campus. We also have a student success podcast uh, that is uh, student developed and co-produced with students. It's our Triton Tools and Tidbits podcast. I really want to emphasize the work that our undergraduate colleges have done in this space, particularly the remote and virtual space, to be available, uh, to be accessible to you remotely for the fall. Uh, your college community has been preparing for your remote arrival, as well as those of you that will be living with us, but uh, studying perhaps partly remotely and part on campus. We take deep pride in our work around equity, diversity, and inclusion and our campus community centers and programs continue to be robust and oriented around issues of, of justice and equity. And our campus community centers have made themselves available virtually and remotely with drop-in sessions, uh, with leadership development and ally development programs, um, as well as community-based experiences for our Black identified students, our Appometta students, um, certainly our LGBTQ students and our students who are parent um, and gender-based programs as well. You will find under our student retention and success portfolio a number of resources available to support in classroom learning as well as outside of the classroom learning and Dr. Figueroa will review those shortly with you but we did want to highlight them in our, in our overview in our Keep Engaging Building Community summary this evening. I also wanted to acknowledge the work that's been happening through our student life areas and Dr. Mahaffey will also speak to that and you'll see that there will be ways for students to engage in organizations, meet with students remotely, um, certainly the work that's happening out of our International Student Programs Office is quite dynamic and we want to acknowledge that there are many resources available on our campus that we haven't highlighted on this slide tonight and you can find a number of them through our virtual student union as well as through the undergraduate colleges our graduate student division website, as well as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs website. And if you are looking for something that we don't have remotely or virtually, we will work in partnership to develop that because it's our intention, again, to keep you at the center of our work together as we come into fall 2020. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for the opportunity to overview this effort. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Figueroa, our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Retention and Success. Thank you. BC Sutherland. We understand that learning in this new environment is new to many of us. Our student success services and programs are committed to helping you succeed. In March, we quickly pivoted and moved to a remote environment. And as we return to learn, we are prepared and ready to provide you support. Some highlights I'd like to share. Undergraduate research opportunities are available and you can book virtual appointments with the Academic Enrichment Program. And our librarians are providing research consultations to help students get started. Tutoring, supplemental instruction, study groups, and support for digital learning is available through Commons and OASIS. Lastly, we will be hosting a number of virtual events that will connect you with peers, faculty, and staff to help you build community. Our faculty mentors, advisors, tutors, and peer leaders are all available and ready via Zoom and phone. We are here to support, to support you, and together we will, got, we will get through this. Please visit our websites to get involved. And now I'd like to pass it to my colleague, ABC of Student Life, Mahavi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Figueroa. So there's uh, just too many great resources to talk about all of them on this slide. So I just want to highlight a couple of resources that will keep you engaging with your health and well-being. First is the playground that is uh, put together by our recreation department. It's a great resource that connects you virtually to a variety of wellness activities. Everything from virtual yoga classes to free weights to guitar on the, play on the playground. You'll also find virtual museums or national park tours and even an e-gaming sports league. So check it out at recreation.ucsd.edu. 
And then if you or someone you know is experiencing any food or housing insecurity at any point, please refer them to the Basic Needs Hub. The Triton Food Pantry is open in two locations now, as well as a mobile pantries around San Diego. We can help with grocery gift cards if you're not in the area. And we also support students who are experiencing housing instability. We also have an off-campus housing coordinator uh, who can also help students uh, find housing off-campus. And we have a website for that as well. Just visit the Basic Needs website, basicneeds.ucsd.edu, to get connected to this great resource. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Ebene. Assistant Vice Chancellor Patty Mahaffey of Student Life. We had Assistant Vice Chancellor of Student Retention and Success, Dr. Figueroa, and as well as our Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs. Next up on the docket is Dulce Dorado, who's the Director of International Students and Programs Office in the Global Education space to give an update on for our international students. Dulce? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, we, I, what, what I want to do is we, I, we, want, we want to recognize that it's been a very difficult and uncertain time for the international student community. You know, please know that UC San Diego is committed to supporting our international students and keeping them informed so that they can make informed decisions and make progress toward their degree. Uh, what I'd like to do quickly is just three updates regarding visa and immigration policies impacting our international students. First, on July 14, the White House rescinded a temporary rule that was issued on July 6 uh, by the Student Exchange Visa Program, or SEVP. The SEVP rule uh, originally removed the pandemic-related exemptions that allowed international students to take a full course load online. Um, in the spring and summer, uh, summer terms. At this time, the International Students and Programs Office is reviewing and evaluating the current guidance, and we expect that there will be forthcoming guidance soon, and we will share that with all of our students on our frequently asked questions page on our website. The second update that I want to provide is that on July 14, the U.S. Department of State announced a phased resumption of visa services at U.S. consulates and embassies around the world. We encourage our students to please check the websites at each of the posts because each of the posts will um, decide their visa status of their services on a case by case basis. The third update that I would like to provide is that we are still advising our students to travel with caution because the COVID-19 presidential problems related to travel restrictions and the COVID-19 labor market uh, proclamations for, for, for non-immigrants still remain in effect. So for more information, again, we have our contact information here on this website and on, our, on the form, it's istudents.ucsd.edu. And what I'd like to say for, in closing is to our international student community, we're committed to your success. Please let us know how we can help, how we can support you throughout your journey here at UC San Diego. So thank you and I'll return it now to Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dulce, and so glad to hear some positive news um, in this world today, um, except as on top of having everyone here. With that, I'd like to invite our undergraduate Dean of Education, John Moore, to share some updates with us all. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Um, so as you've heard before, about 30% of our uh, courses, mainly lower division courses, but not exclusively lower division, will be have in-person components. These might be hybrid courses where the lecture might be remote and then the discussion sections will be in person or they might be actual in-person courses. Pretty much the remainder will be offered remotely and there are only a handful of courses that will not be offered remotely. So it, it, it should be possible um, for almost all students to take all of their courses remotely. So if you feel that you need to stay at home if you need to stay outside of California, it is possible to, to, to have a full um, curriculum in the fall. Dr. Figueroa mentioned um, undergraduate research opportunities, and I'd like to highlight one particular one, the Triton Research and Experiential Learning Scholarships, or known as TRELS. This is um, a partnership between the undergraduate colleges and the Academic Enrichment Program where students are given stipends to do undergraduate research. And it particularly 
um, looks for students who, are, who might not otherwise be able to get into labs. So this means that if you're a first year student, for example, you could well participate in research in your first year and actually get paid to do so. So I encourage you to look into this. We've heard about the college resources. The college advisors are available through virtual advising centers, walk-ins, and scheduled appointments, and these may be um, conducted via Zoom. There may be some limited in-person advising, but probably most of it will be remote. And the college student affairs staffs will provide multiple types of community building activities, and, and um, Vice Chancellor Satterland mentioned those as well. Uh, the colleges offer many leadership possibilities, both in remote and some limited in-person environments. So the colleges have student organizations, just as there are student organizations outside of the colleges. And just as there is an associated student government, there's also each college has its own student government as well. So these are ways that you can get involved with other students in build community. So even though we will be in a remote environment or a partially remote environment, there are still many opportunities to become involved. Thank you very much. And I give this now back to Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Dean Moore, for giving that um, update on what learning could look like for the fall for our Tritons. Next up is our Dean of Graduate Division, Dr. Jim Antony, to give some updates for Grad Division resources. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and welcome, Tritons. It's really wonderful that you are all here. It looks like well over a thousand of you have logged into this webinar. Now, what you might not know about UC San Diego is we have nearly 10,000 graduate and professional students who attend here. It's a very dynamic community, wonderful students who are involved in every aspect of our research program, as well as in our undergraduate education uh, delivery. Now, many of these graduate and professional students never left uh, UC San Diego when the pandemic was at its worst earlier this year. They remained here. Nearly 5,000 of them lived on campus and they've been doing remarkably well, staying engaged with their programs of study, staying engaged with their theses and dissertations and in their research. So what I wanna point you to very, very quickly is if you are a graduate or professional student in this webinar right now, please go to the Graduate Division website and you will see that I have a regular update, a Dean's update almost every single day. A couple of new things get posted there. Um, I wanna to point to one thing in particular. We have a, a, a program called Let's Talk. It's a partnership with uh, our psychological services, Wednesdays from nine to 11.30, and again at one to 3.30 Pacific time, uh, where you can, uh, talk about anxiety, uh, relationships, sleep, anything that's going on in your personal life. These have been really well attended and our students are telling us that they really, really appreciate this uh, partnership that we have with CAPS. Um, and I'm gonna reiterate any sort of updates on COVID-19, please go to the return to learn.ucsd.edu uh, website. Anything for international graduate or professional students, you've heard from Dulce Dorado. I encourage you to go to their website. There it is right there, ISPO. Um, and of course, I reiterate here the basic needs that any of our graduate or professional students might have. We're there to meet those as well. And we would go to the basic needs hub. I just wanna say, if you're new as a graduate or professional student, congratulations uh, on coming to UC San Diego. It's a phenomenal place and look forward to meeting you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dean Anthony. Um, I know him as Jim. I'm so excited for our next panelists. They are our best partners at the University of California, San Diego. They are our student leaders. We have with us our AS student president and our graduate student um, association president, Kimberly and Quinn. Please um, turn on your mics and share your advocacy and thoughts about Return to Learn. Thank you so much for being our partners. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Zheng Tran, and I'm the president of Associated Students here at UC San Diego. Hello, everyone. My name is Quinn Nguyen, and I'm the president of Graduate Student Association. So both Kimberly and I have been involved in the many conversations surrounding Return to Learn and have received many questions from all of our peers. We hear you, and we are actively working on addressing your concerns. Um, some of our priorities are shown here um, as presidents on this slide. And one of the most important ones is AS and GSA will be teaming up with our communications team on a mask wearing campaign to encourage the Triton community to come together and take care of each other. 
Quinn and I also understand how important communication is during this time, particularly between campus leaders and students, and are asking for timely updates to the community. We also recognize that the pandemic has created financial burdens and has had negative psychological impacts on many students. We're working with the Basic Needs Hub and CAPS to provide more support for our students. Lastly, we are committed to advocating for equitable solutions to address the inequities highlighted by the current health and racial crises. So if you have any questions or concerns, please contact us through our websites or social media, and please use this as a resource and let us know how we can support you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all our panelists, in particular our students who just shared how you can be engaged and stay connected and how they're representing your voice in, in all the meetings that they attend. Um, when you were registering, you were able to submit a question. We are now going to open it up to the Q&A section of our panel today. And we are asking all of our panelists who are going to be joining me to answer questions to turn on your cameras. Um, you can leave yourself muted until I call on you, which you'll know when it's coming to you. Um, some of the questions that you have in the Q&A right now, we will be answering as they show up as some of the most popular that we received. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get that started as I see these beautiful faces populating and um, we're ready to go. Excellent. So the first question, no shock, is going to housing and dining. Um, Jana Severson is a director from HDH. What will on-campus housing look like um, for students returning? Thank you, Evan A. So for housing, our current plan is to reduce density on campus and to utilize both single and double occupancy rooms as they were designed originally by architects with the appropriate space. Uh, for each student. So what that means is that where we have had triple beds in the past, they're all being currently removed. So that furniture is being removed over the course of the summer. And that equates to about a loss of 2,075 beds. So we are doing that in an effort to reduce density and uh, create more space for students on campus. You'll also see when you come back that uh, social distancing reminders are going to be placed throughout our facilities. There'll be distance markers on the floor, uh, additional signage regarding safety, furniture adjustments, uh, things that are similar to what you're seeing around you currently out, outside of your home. And uh, all of that is done to support uh, social distancing. So for dining, um, we will be open. We will operate under the guidance of the San Diego County Public Health orders, as the chancellor noted earlier. So those orders will uh, determine what we can offer regarding indoor and outdoor seating. Uh, restrictions may get tighter, restrictions may get loosened, uh, but we do plan on being open and having uh, dining options available for students. This includes our markets as well, for groceries and uh, grab and go items and coffee. Uh, we will have a robust online ordering system called Triton to Go that will help us to facilitate uh, food ordering and pickup and help to eliminate some of the uh, potential lineup and, uh, and doing this in proximity to each other. So um, that is what our vision is for this coming fall. Thank you. What a great vision given that we don't know what is in store for us. I'm glad you were going to make sure our students are fed and have caffeine. Those are two very important <laughs> things that we need to make sure they have. Our next question is going to Dean Moore. Do we need to take at least one in-person class in the fall for 2020? No, you don't. Um, with the exception of a handful of classes, all classes will have remote uh, options. So that means that almost all students will be able to take any class and, um, and do so remotely. Um, about 30% of the classes will also have in-person options, but those classes for the most part will be hybrid and will, and will also have the remote options. So you don't have to be on campus in order to participate in your, in your academic goals. Excellent. Yet yeah, we do welcome you if you choose to be here. So we're trying to keep you safe and educated. That's our job. The next question is going to possibly be answered by two individuals, um, the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Vice Chancellor Satterlin and Dr. Sosha. The question is, we'd like to hear, we'd like to hear, will the public be able to enter campus? 
And if not, what measures will UC San Diego take to enforce to prevent residents from non-residents from entering campus? And then as a follow, yeah, that's it. Let's stop there. <laughs> so how are we going to make sure that people don't just run onto campus and um, how are we going to keep them safe? And I think that there are a piece of question that someone asked also earlier is, can they go off campus if they're staying on campus? So Allison, I'd like to start with you with that. And then if Angela or Jenna want to chime in, please feel free. So our campus is a, a public, a public university, a public space and um, being engaged as part of our community is important to us. What this really is about is every single person who's affiliated or not affiliated with UC San Diego, who's a neighbor, who's a loved one, um, who's a visitor, is, is practicing uh, physical distancing, is wearing a face covering, is practicing good hygiene and, and being attentive to not coming on campus if they have um, symptoms uh, that may uh, suggest that they need to be tested for um, uh, COVID-19. So much of this is about our individual behavior. Again, this is a, a public campus and um, it's, it's important that we each practice um, uh, the best uh, possible uh, uh, hygiene, knowing that we're a part of a community, but we can not restrict access to our campus or um, keep our students from moving off of campus and being a part of our uh, vibrant community outside of um, the campus um, perimeter. That was a great answer. I'm going to have Angela, add, Angela, I see you unmuted. I have a different question. So you can answer that one and add on. Um, but I will say that we have done a great job of putting signs on campus for individuals who've been on campus to understand health and, and, and support on our campus, masking, distancing, and to encourage people that aren't supposed to be on our campus to not be on our campus without being unwelcoming because we are a public institution. Um, with that, Angela, I know you're going to add some to what Dr. Satterlin just said, but how will UCSD be periodically testing their students for those um, taking in-person classes to add on to the other question? Sure. I know. I was just going to say that we want the students' behaviors when they're off our campus to reflect good practices that we want our entire community to engage in. And um, the, give me the second part of that one again, Tiffany. Well, I should have let you go. Um, so the next part of this is how will UC San Diego be periodically testing students that are taking in-person classes? And I think I'd add a little piece to that is people are also very curious of if you don't live on campus, can right. I come get tested? So if you could yes. answer so, those two. Right. Our current plan is to be able to test our community of the campus community on a periodic basis. The modeling suggests that if every 30 days we do an asymptomatic surveillance test, we have a very good chance of early detection of viral activity and bringing it down under control before we have a significant spread. So that would mean not only testing the students who are residents, but our students who are in the San Diego community living off campus who may come on campus to meet with an advisor or to meet with one of their colleagues. Hopefully when they meet with their colleagues, it's outside wearing a mask and with distance because we want them to stay connected to each other and to do that safely. Similarly, our faculties, our employees, our staff, our custodial house and dining, everybody will be in this asymptomatic screening concept um, of periodically looking for viral activity. Thank you so much. The next question goes back to Vice Chancellor Satterlin. How will you enforce social distancing on campus? And not you personally, how will we at UC San Diego enforce it? Well, I really want to preface the point that it's physical distancing. Uh, we know that people need to be connected socially. And I would reiterate part of what I shared towards the first uh, response around um, our, our public ca campus and, and who will be moving on and off our campus. You know, that um, it's our, our individual responsibility to ensure that we're practicing good hygiene, wearing face coverings, uh, and um, being mindful of uh, the six feet recommended distance between individuals, whether we're in class or um, out and about on campus. We are going to be asking students to consider being part of a community pledge, to, to pledge that their behavior will reflect uh, practices that support this community goal. And if we find that we have students who are um, intentionally uh, serving as super spreaders, hosting gatherings, hosting parties, um, we will be able to apply our student code of conduct uh, from a place of, of education first 
and support, of course, um, but we do have the authority to uh, remedy behavior that intentionally uh, poses a risk to the health and well-being of other members of the community. Well, this is back to you, Vice Chancellor Satterlin, but hopefully an easy question. Are the plans for students returning to campus this fall on despite recent statements made by the San Diego Unified School District? You know what, we are following all of the public health guidance and will be responsive to what is expected of us by our public health officials. As of right now, uh, we will be working with the plans that we've outlined through Return to Learn. Thank you so much. The next question is for both our deans. So Anthony and more. How is the university planning to encourage peer interactions among students in a hybrid remote learning environment? There are several things that are happening, both in um, central student affairs as well as in the colleges that will be allowing students to interact in both curricular and co-curricular ways. Um, many of the things that I outlined about student organizations and the activities that, um, that um, Dr. Mahaffey also talked about, these are ways of creating community and um, and there will also be similar academic communities that will be created as well. And as far as graduate and professional students, every single graduate and professional program here um, is taking it upon themselves to customize a particular approach for their students. Uh, there is no one size fits all when it comes to graduate and professional students. And one thing to remember is that in many of our programs, the enrollments are more intimate. The classes tend to be smaller for graduate and professional students. And so that allows us to uh, do things uh, such as social distancing, as Vice Chancellor Satterlin said, which, with much greater ease. But if you're a graduate or professional student, you have any questions about how classes are gonna work and engagement, um, you should contact your program directly and they'll have a plan. Thank you both for those answers. The next question is going to be going to AVC Mahaffey. How will student organizations and clubs be affected when we go on campus? Yeah, well, we have close to 600 student organizations uh, at UC San Diego, and we have, um, that doesn't even count all the organizations that exist in the colleges and all the activities. So our students like to be engaged in the life of the campus. And as far as support, uh, we've been pivoting a lot of our resources online. So we'll be able to uh, offer uh, remote virtual workshops for our student organization principal members. Um, we also uh, are changing one big rule. We are reducing the number of uh, members to register a student organization from four down to three. And that's gonna help out some of our smaller organizations. Uh, so we also have virtual student org adv advising, and then uh, that's available. And then our Associated Students has been super flexible with, uh, with funding for our student organizations as well. So I don't foresee any issues with our student organizations being able to stay fully engaged and involved and connecting with our students, which is going to be super important this year. Thank you so much, ABC Mahaffey. Our students are extremely creative and have been doing great work, and I, we expect no different moving forward. Our next question, we're taking one from the live group and it's coming to you, HDH Jana. Um, can parents help first year students move in on campus? Thank you, that's, that's a great question. Move in is gonna look a little different this year than it has in the past because we will be introducing social, uh, excuse me, physical distancing, I'll correct myself, um, uh, into the operations. So what we, uh, we have a, a few task force that are working currently on uh, the details of the logistics of move-in because we want to be very careful and um, keep everybody safe and uh, have enough space around. So first, let me say that um, we will be spreading out move-in over the course of 10 days, which is uh, different than we would typically do. And that allows us to have fewer students coming to campus on each of those days and uh, gives us time and space to uh, spread out uh, for the move-in process. So what I would expect to see as a family member or a supporter of students is that you may stay with the car, you may stay uh, separate from the check-in area, but your, your student will go and do the check-in process themselves. 
and then come back together with you um, to help with the move-in process. And if I can add in real quick, I would strongly recommend that you really consider what you need to bring with you to campus this year and just really focus on what you may need for fall quarter. Um, it'll make your day, uh, move-in day, much more efficient, much more exciting, and um, much easier when you get to the elevator, which has an occupancy limitation for you as a single person or you and your family members of one at a time. So please um, think about what you really need to bring. And there'll be more information coming out uh, with the detailed logistics as well. Thank you so much. Our next question is going to financial aid. Vonda. Students wanna know, is our financial aid distribution affected during this COVID-19? Um, thanks for that question, Ebony. Our financial aid counselors are working hard uh, remotely to ensure that we have financial aid on time when school starts. So uh, financial aid will go on as usual and we'll disperse on time. Uh, the general timeline is 10 days before the first day of instruction. Students should see their financial aid on their student account. Um, and then we begin to, well, actually Student Financial Solution begins to uh, release any funds that were not needed to cover their current balance. And those are released to students in the form of a check or a uh, direct deposit. And those go out usually the first week of school. So there are no delays um, on financial aid. As long as students do their end and make sure that they complete all their documents and required tasks that are listed in uh, Triton Link, they need to be enrolled. Um, and meet all the other requirements. Thank you so much, Vonda. I'm going to cheat and ad lib a little bit. I saw a question about, are we gonna have classes on the lawn? We actually do have a group looking to see if that can happen. And we have some faculty who have already volunteered to host their classes at the beach. Um, we're working on technology to make all of that happen and we're staying creative so that we can keep you safe. I'm so shocked that they volunteered that. Our next question is to Dean Anthony again. Uh, again, thank you for welcoming and congratulating our incoming students. We're so excited to have our new Tritons. Our incoming graduate students want to know, will they be allowed to have in-person interactions with their faculty to develop a bond that's essential to their success as graduate students here? Thanks for the question. It's terrific. And it's something that's been on the minds of every graduate program. I'm going to go back to my previous answer, which is each of the graduate and professional programs are customizing an approach that really does make sense for them. Um, so I, I would encourage you to reach out as soon as possible to the grad program coordinator and ask them how they're thinking about this. Obviously, there's going to be some flexibility. Things might shift uh, as things shift. Um, but for now, I know everybody is really concern to try and find a way with appropriate social distancing um, to engage you as a new graduate professional student. Thank you so much, Dean Anthony. This is going back to our Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs. Allison, how do you think 2021 will look for UC San Diego? Frankly, if, if I could answer that question with any guarantee, by all means, I would do that. I, I just don't know. I mean, I I hope that we'll have our students um, healthy and I hope that they'll be able to do the things that they love and be able to participate in our traditions as um, they so uh, desire to and um, to be in community with one another. Um, I do think that some of the innovations that have come out of this um, uh, per uh, particularly difficult time uh, will stay with us. I know that at the very least our students will be uh, more resilient and more committed to um, social change. I don't know if other uh, colleagues on uh, the call would want to, um, on the town hall would want to offer additional um, thoughts on that. Anyone else have any thoughts? Please just unmute yourself. I'm watching. No, I'm going to leave the vice chancellor to answer. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Allison, for taking that hardball question. We all can't predict the future, but we're definitely concerned about um, you know, what that could look like. So we understand that you have the question. We have the same question. Um, going back to Angela, Dr. Sosha, do students need to wear masks when exercising outside? Right now, the county recommendations, you don't when you're actively exercising alone and away from someone, but you need to carry a mask with you because you might encounter someone else. 
And so it's a good idea to have that mask with you, but we're not currently recommending a continuous wearing when you're engaged in active exercise. I think when you're walking over to the track, let's say, put your mask on. Walking is not exercising. So we want to be mindful of that. And I think as our students said, we're going to try and create a culture that you'll look odd if you're not wearing a mask and you're just ambling around. You will look like the oddball because all the rest of us will have our masks on. I am laughing because I agree with what you're saying, but I'd like to say walking is exercising for some of us, okay? Some people call it hiking. Um, a question that you identified you wanted to answer live is, does the support of the infected individual in, incur any cost directly to the students? Is it all covered by UC SHIP? Right. I, I saw a number of questions about um, insurance and coverage. And so basically all the COVID testing that's asymptomatic where we're doing surveillance screening, there will be no cost to anyone for that. Symptomatic screening is covered by all insurance plans, including UC SHIP, and we'll make sure our students don't have any co-pays or out-of-pocket costs associated with the symptomatic screening. For our students who live on campus, if they need to move into isolation housing, which again moves them to a place where the only one, they're the only one in the unit with their own bedroom, bathroom, and small common area, they um, will get their meals delivered to them. There'll be no extra cost for that support. The clinical team calls them every day. There are no costs for that, as well as the CAP support. For our students who live off campus, um, we are not able to bring the meals to them, although we've occasionally helped on a basic needs, special needs, but generally those students are able to get their meals through other ways. But we do a daily medical check-in for them as well at no cost. The CAPS team is available. We continue to support our students who are um, potentially needing to be in isolation off campus, giving them the CDC guidance, just as if you were an adult and you had COVID and living at your home, you get the guidance how to live at home in isolation safely. Thank you so much, Dr. Sosha. I think you might be connected to the next question I have. I'm so shocked you're popular on this call for some strange reason. But I also have HDH marked for this one. How can we be sure that on-campus housing with roommates will be safe? And you can bounce it to HDH first or you can start, doesn't matter. I think there's no way in this situation with this virus to be perfectly safe everywhere unless we lived in a total bubble, had our food somehow grown in the room we were living in, never walked out of it, never saw another human being. So knowing that, we're gonna do everything we can to really try and minimize the risk of acquiring virus by keeping it minimally present on our campus. Um, I think we did, hope to do very well with this strategy. I think good responsible behavior by our student body, by our campus community, um, is also going to really reduce the risk of spread. Um, this virus doesn't walk on its own. It has to move from person to person. So our behaviors have a huge ability to impact um, the transmission of the virus. So I think it's our commitment to each other to keep um, our community safe and take care of ourselves, our family, our colleagues. Yeah, you just, want to add? Sure, yeah. sure. I would just add uh, uh, just a note that we have continued to have students living with us through spring quarter and through through the summer as well as apartment mates and as suite mates. And we've had great success with our testing and, and the results of our testing. So I would echo what Dr. Sosha shared, which is that it's you know a commitment that we will all make to each other. And um, as students coming to campus, I would strongly encourage you to be prepared to have a conversation with your roommates about how you are going to live together to keep each other safe and be committed to that with the support of, of uh, university staff to help in those conversations. Thank you so much. Um, our Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs gets all the hardball questions. Where will there be any changes to tuition? This is a really important question, and I, I want to share that I also know that the response can be uh, frustrating. So tuition and fees are set at the Office of the President on behalf of the um, entire University of California. In response to this, we have been uh, absolutely working as diligently as possible to make all of our resources uh, available uh, remotely and virtually. And for our students who will be living on campus, make sure that our recreation spaces and our, our engagement opportunities um, and our health resources are also available in person with the public health guidelines in mind as well. 
Thank you. So our ABC of student retention and success. For newly admitted transfer students, how will UC San Diego compensate those of us who seek connection when instruction is online? Thank you, Dr. Williams. First off, congratulations to all of our transfer students. Um, what a year to culminate your associate's degree at the community college and start with us at UC San Diego. We are excited to have you. Um, and there are many ways that students can meet online, virtual spaces. Um, one of them, the Triton Transfer Hub, will be hosting events um, specific to transfer students based on express interests. We will also have the Triton Transfer Forum available where you can connect with other transfer students, faculty, and staff. And right now, we have a Microsoft Teams group available if you would like to reach out and engage. Information on how to engage can be found on transferstudentsaltogether.ucsd.edu. Um, additionally, your colleges also host events for transfer students. Keep your eyes open for Transfer Tuesdays. This is uh, an opportunity for you to hang out and um, explore hot, hot topics that are specific to transfer students. Um, and last but not least, um, there are plenty of organizations um, that are specific to transfer students. Um, and to get involved, you want to go to getinvolved.ucsd.edu. Thank you so very much. I will be coming back to you after this question, but I have a question for Dean Antony. Um, how will students be able to participate in research during this transition period? So uh, we're talking about graduate and professional students. Um, I wanna remind you again, most of our graduate and professional students, they tend to be older than undergraduates. So um, they have been here, just like Jana has said, Jana Severinsen, they've been living on our campus. They've been fully engaged in their studies and for many of them fully engaged in their programs of research. Um, a lot of the advisors are very aware of the need to continue doing work with their graduate students. And a lot of this is negotiated on a one-on-one one -on -one basis, always paying attention to guidelines that the campus sets about safety. So if you have questions about that, talk to your advisor, uh, talk to your principal investigator, and you could always contact my office and we can help facilitate that conversation. And I'd like to just jump in about undergraduate research. Um, we've seen through spring quarter that our undergraduate students who have been engaged in research have been extremely active. There has not been a slowdown of the number of students uh, or reduction of the number of students who have been engaged in research and particularly working through the academic enrichment program and working through the colleges, um, there, there are great opportunities for research. So some of it may be done remotely, some of it may involve more literature review, but there are, there are real opportunities for research for undergraduates. I might also add that, you know, we are a major world-class research university. Research is one of the foundations of what we do. And as uh, our GSA president can attest to, I know that she's involved in her research as we speak. Nothing has slowed down for her. Well, time goes so fast when you're having a good time. We know that we answered some of the questions you asked. We know that there are a lot of questions that weren't answered. There's some questions about first gens. Please visit srs.ucsd.edu. There was a question about classroom sizes and priority registration. Our registrar's office and our dean of edu education, as well as our faculty, as well as our department leadership have made sure that those classes are available and that you will be able to graduate in a timely fashion despite this pandemic. They have worked very hard to make that happen, several groups and several organizations. With that, I'd like you to join me in thanking all of our phenomenal panelists for all their work and their time. We thank you for registering and being here. We're so excited to have you as Tritons. Go Tritons, and thank you for being here tonight. And we look forward to either seeing you in person, seeing you with a mask on, or seeing you remotely as we continue to be in community together here at UC San Diego. Thanks for being here tonight on Return to Learn Town Hall.